Okay, we're gonna get we're gonna get started up again. Um, I know we I know we've had we've, a, a lot of interesting subjects have been raised so far. A lot of, of fun stuff uh, to talk about. Um, uh, it, moderating our next panel uh, is Jay Pendergrass, class of seventy nine, um, who we were thrilled was willing to come back to help us uh, with the program. Uh, he is the Vice President for Programs and Publications at the Environmental Law Institute. I'm sure many of the folks who are here are familiar with uh, ELI's many fine publications, the Environmental Law Reporter, uh, the Environmental Forum Magazine, uh, the various books it, and, and research guides it puts out, as well as the other work that it, done, it does, uh, and, and, and Jay's a, a big part of that, uh, overseeing the Research and Policy Division at ELI. I will turn it over to him. Uh, and let him introduce uh, our next uh, set of panelists. And uh, so, Jay, it's all yours. The one additional, uh, also proud to be a uh, alum of the Law Review, so uh, very pleased that uh, Law Review is co-sponsor here. Um, and one uh, plug for the students here, um, you are eligible for free membership in the Environmental Law Institute, which gets you one of the publications in the Environmental Forum. Um, and uh, so, uh, Please, uh, please join. Um, we'd love to, to have you. So um, <clears throat> our panel, Under Pressure, EPA's response to lofty expectations and political demands. Um, and uh, to introduce our uh, speakers, uh, Professor Michael Livermore uh, joined the UVA faculty uh, in 2013, teaches uh, all the important courses, environmental law, administrative law, regulatory law and policy, uh, as well as advanced <laughs> seminars. Um, and his uh, research focuses on environmental law, regulation, uh, interesting one uh, that uh, is computational analysis of law. Um, does a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work, um, working with uh, uh, people in other academic fields. And um, I will... Uh, I guess finished with that uh, he clerked for Judge Harry T. Edwards on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Uh, Professor Brian Mannix uh, is a recognized national expert on energy and environmental policy and regulation. Uh, from 2005 to 2009, he served as uh, EPA's Associate Administrator for Policy, Economics, and Innovation. Earlier, he served as Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, has uh, had a number of appointments with other federal and state agencies and uh, research positions at policy think tanks um, and uh, uh, holds uh, uh, degrees in mathematics and chemistry and uh, public policy from uh, uh, Harvard. And Professor Wendy Wagner is the Richard Dale Endowed Chair at the uh, University of Texas School of Law um, and uh, clerk for the Honorable Albert Engel of the U.S. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, was an honors attorney in the Environmental Enforcement Section of Department of Justice um, before her first academic appointment here at uh, Case Law School. Um, her research focuses on issues related to the design of, of uh, bureaucratic processes, environmental and health regulation, law and science. Um, uh, author of, uh, of books on the subjects, and uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from the three of you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Should I start us off? Great. Uh, well, thank whoever, you. whoever is <laughs> got the slides, if we well, have I, ha I don't have slides, 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 actually. To start us off. Have, I, I rarely have been so glad that I don't have slides as I have it today. <laughs> um, so, um, well, thanks very much. It's a delight to be here. This has already been a fantastically interesting day, um, and I look forward to, um, forward to this panel, of course, and, and our conversation. So the subject that we're going to be talking about uh, for the next little bit is the relationship between politics and um, an agency decision-making at EPA. And so I thought I would, and so, you know, I'll be focusing on this, and I will kind of emphasize the role uh, that economic analysis plays in um, in negotiating that balance. And so we've talked a little bit about this already today in the context of co-benefits and the MATS rule. I will return to that, although I will try to keep that relatively short um, because we've already spoken about that quite a bit. But, um, 
Uh, but that's going to basically be the theme of the talk. So one of the things I think is important at the outset to recall is that we, you know, we normally do not think that all political influence over agency decision making is a bad thing, right? Um, in fact, a consistent critique of the administrative state that we have is that it lacks a solid democratic pedigree, right? So unlike the legislature, which is elected, we have administrative agencies, most of the officials of which, most of whom um, lack direct democratic accountability at all. Um, and in what we have instead is a system where the president uh, appoints the senior managers at, at most agencies. And that's part of the way that we solve the problem of democratic accountability for administrative agencies. We actually embed our agencies in the political process through, uh, through the appointment of senior officials and through accountability to the president and therefore ultimately to the electoral process. And indeed, this is one of the justifications that has been raised by courts for the deference that's provided to agencies. So in the very famous Chevron case, uh, the majority discusses the political accountability of agencies as one of the reasons why courts ought to defer to agency interpretations of the statutes that they administer. So the idea isn't that we want to entirely uh, extract agency, extract politics from agency decision making, but of course we also do not think that agencies are appropriate um, simply as merely instruments of partisan politics. Right? We think that part of what agencies do is impartially administer the law. They bring to bear their expertise on social problems, um, and they do so in a way that is in some ways insulated from the, uh, uh, from the messy and often uh, problematic context of partisan politics. All right? So what we have is attempts broadly across the administrative state and then certainly at EPA to balance these two countervailing uh, ideals. On the one hand, some version of democratic accountability and on the other, some version of impartiality and expertise and, uh, and sound uh, decision making. So the way that this has largely been achieved over the past several decades is through a set of what I'm going to refer to as guardrails. And the guardrails, uh, at least, arguably achieve this balance. So within the guardrails, there is some scope for political influence. We do not think that agencies are going to do the same exact thing under Democratic and Republican uh, administrations, for example. Uh, but the guardrails limit and cabin the influence that politics is going to have. And this has worked reasonably well for us. This, is, this system of guardrails has kind of grown up over several decades. Um, it really uh, starts to really take on the kind of the cast that it current, currently has, uh, starting in like the late 70s and into the 1980s, where we start to see you know, more probing judicial review of certain kinds of agency decisions and the uh, uh, application of OIRA review, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the White House. Um, and so we have both these institutional guardrails, you know, probing review by courts, um, external to the executive, within the executive, we have a wire review in the White House, and then we also have substantive requirements that are placed on agencies, um, sometimes by courts, uh, uh, requirements around reason giving, and then sometimes internal to the executive, and specifically the requirement that agencies conduct economic analysis of their major rulemakings. Um, so this requirement has, of course, as many folks here are well aware, has been around since 1981. There's actually precursors before 1981 when Ronald Reagan puts in place an executive order that requires agencies to engage in this kind of analysis. And so what does cost-benefit analysis do? I think it's worth just kind of taking a step back. It's a fairly straightforward idea, is that agencies, when they're regulating, ought to take, uh, take into consideration the positive and negative effects of their, uh, of their decisions, and that they ought to seek out rules with the largest net benefits. That's the basic principle. Um, and you know this has a long history, of course, like I said, going back to 1981. And the one important part of this history is that this, these principles and these institutions have been endorsed by administrations of both political parties. Okay, so this is something that has existed, um, you know, for a long time and with a broad amount of consensus. This doesn't necessarily mean they agree about everything, but the basic architecture um, is something that represents a, 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 an important element of consensus. Another important kind of component of how economics uh, serves to uh, inform how politics is balanced against um, other norms in the administrative state is the importance of consistent methodology. 
okay, that there's this element of consistency in how economic analysis is done across agencies. And some of this has already been mentioned. I'll just reiterate because I think it's worth, uh, uh, worth keeping in mind. So at EPA, uh, there have been peer-reviewed guidelines for how you conduct economic analysis that, again, have been around for decades, that administrations of both political parties uh, or during both the, the, you know, the, when both political parties have been in office, um, have contributed to developing, and they, they've been used in administrations of both political parties to evaluate uh, EPA rules. Another important touchstone, which again was, was, was mentioned briefly, is the, what's referred to as the A4 circular. This is a document that was put in place uh, during the George W. Bush administration that establishes methods for how you conduct cost-benefit analysis. Okay? And one of the values of these consistent methodologies is that it helps um, avoid the problem, which is a critique of cost-benefit analysis, is that it's used to simply provide post hoc rationalizations for policies that are arrived on other grounds. Okay, so when you have well-established best practices for cost-benefit analysis, they reduce this threat because they create a clear standard that you can then use to hold the agency accountable. If the agency departs from established methods, then you, that's a red flag that alerts the public um, to the possibility of manipulation. Okay, and so, so these established methods play a very important role in informing how the public perceives agency decisions. Where, and one kind of consequence of this, is that the larger the departure in a particular rulemaking from established methods, the more problematic that is, the greater the rationale or the justification that would need to be provided for that, for that departure, okay? And so again, there are kind of two very general things that cost-benefit analysis does for this balance. One is it um, creates a very general principle to look at comprehensively, look at the costs and the benefits, the positive and negative effects of a, of a rulemaking, and it provides a means for the public and, you know, and, 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 and other observers to understand when politics is kind of being played with the regulatory process, when there's kind of been a, a problematic intrusion of politics into agency decision making. Okay. Um, so the history of economics at EPA is actually largely a, a, quite a happy one. So although the agency largely at the very beginning resisted um, the move to more cost-benefit analysis, what ultimately the agency realized is that it was better to learn how to conduct strong cost-benefit analysis than try to fight. And again, this is stuff that's already been mentioned, but uh, a, a substantial amount of effort has gone into building out really a world-class um, a community at EPA of economists who are capable of doing just you know really excellent uh, economic analysis. They th have thought very hard about how to address um, lots of difficult issues that come up when doing economic analysis of rulemaking, um, especially environmental rulemaking. EPA rules often uh, affect n things that are not traded on markets, uh, or at least not traded directly on markets, like public health, um, like ecosystems. And so, you know, the agency has over the years developed ways of, of, of engaging in this cost-benefit analysis, even under conditions when it's actually quite, quite difficult. Um, and and in, in that process, it has it developed these methods that it applies over and over and over again in a consistent way. So one example is the value of statistical life. The agency has to place a value on mortality risk reductions, and, um, you know, it, it took, you know, a number of years to put together a method for doing that. Um, and, but, it, but it has had in place a very you know, consistent approach to dealing with that uh, over the years. Um, okay, so, so this is, you know, again, like a very happy story. We, many EPA rules, um, the cost-benefit analysis of, of those rules that have been done show very substantial net benefits. When you look uh, programmatically, for example, we've, we've seen several folks mention uh, programmatic assessments that have been done of the Clean Air Act, you really see these huge net benefits that have been generated, uh, sometimes counted in the trillions of dollars. So this is just uh, very, very substantial, uh, you know, benefits that you can monetize and you can and you can go to kind of take those to the bank. Um, we can actually take them to the bank because they're public health benefits. But you know, the idea is that there, you know, there, there's very good reason to think that these benefits exist. So, so this kind of takes us to the current administration, and I, and I think it's important for us to you know, to understand 
that the tradition of doing these rigorous cost-benefit analyses and using them to inform decision-making and cabining political influence over agency decision-making, that's not something that we necessarily take for granted. It's something that got built. Um, it's something that could be torn down, and it may, in fact, be much more sensitive and fragile than I think we, we really understand. So this administration has uh, taken a number of steps that represent very substantial departures from methodological best, best practices that have been around and endorsed by both political parties. This isn't merely a kind of a red flag for one particular rulemaking, but is really a kind of across the board um, uh, signal that cost benefit analysis is not playing its traditional role of protecting the agency from, uh, uh, you know, from undue or uh, inappropriate political influence. So I just have a, I have a couple of minutes, a few minutes, so I will talk um, about the MATS rule. There are other examples. Um, so just to, to, to give quick other examples so we don't spend too much time on MATS again, um, uh, proposed uh, rulemaking by the agency to limit the kind of scientific uh, information that's available, um, specifically making it more difficult to uh, use epidemiological studies in agency rulemakings because of requirements around what kind of data would have to be made available, um, which if, were, if it were applied retroactively, which may happen, um, would knock out some of the most important studies that support uh, 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 especially air quality protections and show the really massive benefits that are associated with those. Um, but just to kind of put a fine point on the, on the issue that we've been talking about, um, which, is the, uh, which is this MATS rule. So what we're talking about here is, there's actually a couple different components to this. So, so the, MATS, the, the MATS rule adopted by the Obama administration um, was directed at this kind of you might think of as target and non-target risks. So it's directed at certain target risks that are associated with mercury exposure. And one important kind of piece of this is that the agency does not say that there are not substantial benefits from mercury exposure, a reduction to mercury exposure. So that's sometimes bandied about. It's used in political rhetoric. But the agency says that there are very, in that rulemaking, that there are very substantial um, effects associ associated with mercury exposure that will be reduced. What it doesn't do is it doesn't quantify those effects. So when folks say that like 99% of the benefits of the, of, the, of the rule are from PM reduction, that's not actually what the agency said at the time. What the agency said at the time is that there are very substantial benefits from mercury exposure, we're not quantifying them, and we're gonna quantify this other chunk. And so it's, it's misleading to say that the benefits are only attributable to the PM reductions, it's actually that they're attributable, to, well, it's that the, the, the monetized uh, quantified benefits uh, are attributed there. The other important thing, and this goes to the point about consistency, is that the EPA, EPA has been looking at co-benefits in its rulemakings for decades, for administrations of both political parties. It's what the A4 circular says that you're supposed to do. It's what EPA's own guidance says that you're supposed to do. It's what the Trump administration, EPA, has done in other rulemakings. So for example, in its efforts to roll back the uh, fuel economy standards for automobiles, one of the major benefits of the rollback, according to the agency, it's actually wrong about this, but if it were right, it would be that, uh, that there's gonna be life savings benefits from reduced uh, fatalities from uh, auto accidents. That's a, obviously an indirect benefit, and it, as far as the agency is concerned, perfectly legitimate to take that into consideration. So, what's, so, so the MATS rule is really special in the way that the agency has said, look, we're not gonna consider co-benefits in this context. That's why we've been talking about it all day, because it represents this really radical departure from practice. And it's exactly this kind of inconsistency that raises a red flag. So, so Don raises the point that there's a difference between a legal and an economic justification, which is very true. And so um, I just wanted to point out that the agency's legal justification for failing to look at the co-benefits of MATS is incredibly terrible. Um, <laughs> and, and so what the, if you look at the language of 111 or 112N, and I'll be really quick about this, I just got my time. So the language doesn't say anything about not taking costs into consideration, costs or benefits or co-benefits or anything like that. None of that is actually in the statute. It says that the agency is to regulate electricity uh, uh, unit steam generating units under the section if the administrator finds such regulation is appropriate and necessary after considering the results of a public health study required by a, par a subparagraph of the statute. That's it. Okay, that's the whole language. It doesn't say anything about not considering uh, uh, indirect effects. 
So the court, the Supreme Court has interpreted this language because the agency in the first instance actually didn't want to consider costs. And so the court knocked them down. And what the court said is, quote, appropriate is the classic broad and all encompassing term that naturally and traditionally includes consideration of all the relevant factors. So you could not get language more expansive than that coming from the court. And so the idea that either Michigan BEPA or the statute itself uh, prohibits the consideration of indirect effects is just uh, is just not strong from a statutory or in any kind of legal perspective. Um, so the final just thought on this is that part of the reasons why the guardrails have been effective is because administrations of both political parties have agreed to play by the rules. Okay, in the past, if you wanted to, if a democratic administration wanted to depart under pressure from folks on the left, for example, uh, from using cost-benefit analysis, they might think to themselves, well, we don't want to do that because a future Republican administration, we want them to also play by the rules. There is a, a reciprocity in these kinds of norms. And so the concern now, I think, going forward is not only that the, this administration is going to adopt bad rules, which it's in the process of trying to do, but that future administrations will also decide that they don't need to play by the rules either. And the entire kind of system that we have constructed to protect agency decision making from this kind of raw partisan political influence is going to be a casualty of the current administration as well. Okay. It's depressing. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I go for. I've got slides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that no, no. no. we'll be able to read them. Um, the title of our panel is EPA's response to lofty expectations and political demands. And I'm going to talk a little bit about its response to uh, some less lofty uh, expectations <laughs> and political demands, uh, which are ubiquitous in all administrations. Um, but we were talking before the conference be began, some of us, uh, and I, I said, you know, it's, it's EPA's 50th birthday coming up. It's probably not fair to start with the, the recitation of the grievances, <laughs> but uh, there is a lot of that. So I want to I say in advance that um, I do love EPA. My first full-time job was at EPA back in 1977. Um, I did oversight of EPA rules at uh, OMB from 79 to 87. Uh, when I worked in Richmond, uh, my first political appointment was in Richmond, Virginia, and, and supervising, among other agencies, Virginia's DEQ. And so I got to see a whole other side of EPA that I hadn't really appreciated until you're working in a state and trying to uh, uh, manage that interface. Uh, and then finally, I returned to EPA uh, 2005 to 2009 to, to run the policy office. Um, so what do I find attractive about EPA? Well. It sounds a little funny, but unlike many other agencies, it has a real reason to exist. And in Washington, there are hundreds of agencies, many with regulatory powers. Sorry, sorry about that. And you know, when I look at them through an economic lens, uh, it's often hard to think of why do we really need that agency or why is it at the federal level? Um, but that's not true of EPA. EPA does have uh, a real mission. There's a real market failure that needs to be remedied. Uh, it's got bipartisan support, wide, widespread public support. There are things we could do better. I think we could do a much better job of using federalism, figuring out who should be doing what with which pollutants. Uh, we could do a better job of using property rights. It, it drives me crazy every time we sign a treaty for the ocean or Antarctica or uh, outer space and call it the common heritage of mankind. I mean, read the tragedy of the commons and let's stop calling everything a commons. Figure out how to make property rights work. We've done it in fisheries. Uh, we can do it with other things. And we can do a better job of using uh, market-like remedies, which several speakers have talked about today. Uh, they work better, they work cleaner, uh, and we can do more of that. Uh, in the end, though, we're still going to need a federal agency with responsibility for environmental rules. And so I say EPA has a legitimate Baptist reason to be. What do I mean by that? Uh, many of you will have heard of Bruce Yandel and his theory of bootleggers and Baptists. And here's uh, his most succinct description of it. Durable social regulation evolves when it's demanded by both of two distinctly different groups. Baptists point to the moral high ground and give the vital and vocal endorsement of laudable public benefits. 
Uh, bootleggers are much less visible, but no less uh, vital. Bootleggers expect to profit from the very regulation, regulatory restrictions desired by the Baptists, uh, grease the political machinery with some of their expected proceeds. They're simply in it for the money. Now, he says bootleggers are vital. I should clarify that, that Bruce here is talking about an empirical theory, and bootleggers are an important part of an empirical theory that explains a lot of the regulatory landscape, and he has lots of examples. He's, he's got books on this. Um, as a normative statement, uh, that really stinks. No, we don't want bootleggers messing with our regulations and diverting regulatory author authority to their own ends. Um, but there are lots of examples uh, at EPA. In the first, I think was documented in uh, a book, Clean Coal, Dirty Air, by Bruce Ackerman and William Hassler. Um, during EPA's first decade and the beginnings of the Clean Air Act, and many others, others here can tell this story in more detail than I can, uh, but there were a lot of compromises made in the Clean Air Act. Uh, one of them, which we heard about, was the, the decision to use scrubbers rather than to use cleaner western coal, low sulfur coal. Uh, it was not the best way to go about cleaning up those plants. In other words, the decision to grandfather older electric generating units, uh, some of which are still with us today, and they've caused no end of uh, trouble over the years. That, that difference between new sources and old sources uh, has been a constant vexation to EPA uh, and has led to a, a lot of trouble. Another is the land ban of hazardous waste. EPA banned the disposal of hazardous waste in landfills. I don't know if that was right or not. I, I mean, I can see why that might be a good thing to do. But they did it when there were only a handful of lawful uh, incinerators who could handle uh, hazardous <coughs> waste. And that was the only legal way to get rid of hazardous waste. There weren't enough incinerators. They were not in all the right places. And so the result was they also uh, refused to allow burning uh, at sea. Of course, that's an international matter, not so much a domestic EPA matter. But someone built an incinerator ship to burn hazardous waste at mm -hmm. sea, far from any population. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to use it. Uh, so the result was very high costs for disposing of hazardous waste, uh, costs that were passed through the consumers, making it a very expensive decision, and more illegal dumping because uh, companies, just some of them couldn't figure out how to, or couldn't afford to pay for the incineration, and I think it, uh, it caused a lot of untold damage. Another example, phasing out CFCs. Now this is a success story. The Montreal Protocol, uh, got the U.S. And, and other countries to uh, reduce the production of CFCs, used mostly as refrigerants, uh, replace them with, uh, with substitutes that are less damaging to the ozone layer. And I think scientists will tell you today that we have succeeded in, uh, in re reversing, not just stopping, but reversing the damage to the, uh, the ozone layer. But if you go back and look at the decisions that were made, when uh, particular refrigerants were banned, <coughs> when new ones were approved, how many were available, it was tailored very closely to the manufacturer's uh, patent portfolio. Uh, when a patent ran out, ran out on a refrigerant, uh, EPA would then ban it and require a substitute, which lo and behold, that same manufacturer had just gotten a patent on. Mm -hmm. and that went on for years. So. One company got very rich, and because it was an international treaty, they were able to suppress foreign competition, too. I think that made this a success story, but an unnecessarily expensive uh, expe ex success story. Um, the perfect pesticide, EPA says, borrowed a page from FDA and its drug approval and said, well, Congress is requiring us to register pesticide, pesticides and then re-register them. Uh, it's really a burden. Let's just pick a specific application like uh, killing Japanese beetles on golf courses. Uh, compare the r relative risk to the pesticides that can do that, and then we'll approve one and disapprove the rest. It's a policy that doesn't, it gives no attention to the value of competition and innovation. Uh, I think EPA doesn't do it all the time, but they did for a while slip into this pattern, and I don't think it was particularly helpful in moving us to uh, a more innovative uh, effective uh, and safe pesticides. Lead and gasoline. Several people have talked about this, and it's, it's for good reason. Uh, 
It was probably the most consequential decision that EPA made, removing lead from gasoline. I know the administrators I worked for most recently, Steve Johnson, had been a career employee at EPA, was eventually, he rose to the level of deputy administrator and then administrator. After 30 years, he was asked when he left, what was the most important decision the EPA has ever made? And he said, taking lead out of gasoline. The striking thing is that that was something that OMB had to ask EPA to do. EPA had, they started phasing out lead in 1973, reducing the level of lead in leaded gasoline and later required unleaded gasoline to be available too. But they gave small refiners a looser standard. A small refiner could use five times as much lead as a large refiner. Why? Well, because they complained and EPA found that they could pay them off by giving them extra lead. Small refiners also got extra crude oil entitlements from DOE. What that means is at the time in the Carter administration, oil prices were regulated. Domestic oil prices were regulated, not foreign oil prices. So every refiner had an entitlement to a certain amount of cheap domesticated oil, domestic oil, and the small refiners got an extra boost. They got a large extra boost. The result was that small refiners were among the most powerful lobbies in Washington. These were not mom and pop operations. They were very wealthy. In 1981, OMB proposed putting all refiners on the same lead standard and to allow trading so that nobody was being subsidized. EPA fought hard against this, but eventually capitulated. It was challenged in court, but eventually prevailed. And as a result, in the next three years, more than half of all the refineries in the United States closed. Why? Because they existed only to collect those subsidies from DOE and from EPA. We know this because through 1980, Jimmy Carter had wage and price controls looking at the gross margins of refiners. That is, we knew the value of all the oil that went in one side of the refinery and all the oil products that came out the other side, and just ignore the cost and the capital and the people, just looking at what's going in and what's going out, what came out was worth less on the market than what went in. There was subtracting value from everything that went through those refineries. Why would they do that? They did it year after year just to collect the subsidies from DOE and EPA. So when those subsidies were cut off by oil deregulation and by the 1982 lead rule, those refineries closed. Two years later, after those refineries had closed, OMB asked EPA to phase out lead altogether, which they did mostly over the next three years. There was almost no opposition because no one was getting a subsidy. That couldn't have been done two years earlier. It was only able to be done in this stepwise fashion. First, make sure you're not using lead to subsidize somebody, and then propose, ask the question, why do we really need lead in our gasoline? And the answer was no. Other countries quickly followed. I mean, it took 20 years, but it was another 200 countries. And it's interesting to follow that story. But whole continents would switch, would remove the lead. Saudi Arabia did a great job in places like India and China. In South America, it was Brazil producing all that ethanol. Anyway, the global benefits of removing lead from gasoline are estimated at almost $3 trillion per year. So, yes, it was a big deal. CAFE standards, I'm not going to dwell on this, but you may have wondered, because I'm running out of time, you may have wondered why auto manufacturers favor the strict mileage standards while the Trump administration is trying to roll them back. Well, the auto manufacturers, they do want relief. They know they can't achieve the standards that the Obama administration had put into place for future years. But they want that relief in the form of tailored exceptions and adjustments. That is, they want higher standards that raise the price of new vehicles. They want to be able to sell vehicles for the higher price. But they want exceptions that allow them to sell vehicles that don't meet the standards. They take a lot of different forms. The footprint adjustment is the one I'll mention. If your wheels are farther apart, if the area under the wheels of a car are larger, then you get a free mileage boost. You don't have to actually achieve the mileage. 
but you get a boost in determining compliance with the standards. There are lots of gimmicks like that in the CAFE standards. Uh, it's very unfortunate because it makes it hard to figure out what's really in the public interest. Finally, uh, the RFS bootleggers. The Renewable Fuel Standard is a terrible program. It's a cross-subsidy, effectively taxing gasoline and subsidizing ethanol. It's very costly for consumers who are buying gasoline, uh, and not just for gasoline, it also raises the prices of food. It's damaging to the environment. It hurts air quality, it hurts water quality. Uh, it's really distorted land use. Um, and primarily, the benefits flow to ethanol refiners and to a lesser extent to farmers who grow corn. So in this administration, uh, they got a lot of complaints from refiners. And rather than try to reform the standard, which would take, really, it would take legislation, uh, but they do have the authority to give exceptions. So they started handing out exceptions to refiners who asked for them. Uh, interestingly, when they got them, those small refiners, and in some cases, large refiners, when they got an exception, they would then turn around and short the RIN market. The RIN market is where you trade the, the credits for, uh, for ethanol that you're supposed to be adding to your fuel. And then when they realize, well, if I've got an exception, that lowers the effective demand for ethanol this year, and I can short the market, and when everybody else finds out I have an exception, uh, I'll make some money because the price will shift. Uh, EPA has recently moved to, to try to prevent that practice. Um, but giving exemptions like that, it ensures that consumers still pay high prices, the refiners still enjoy selling gas at higher prices, uh, but they don't have to, some of them don't have to put ethanol in. Um, very little relief, I'm at the end, so I'm going to move along. Uh, very little relief for the environment, but the pie is divided now between ethanol and oil refiners. Uh, finally, the president instructed EPA to do something more for the farmers and the ethanol people. Uh, so there is a plan to increase the, uh, the total requirement, um, which will hurt consumers more, but make the pie bigger. That is the money that the consumers pay into the system, which will get divided between oil and ethanol refiners. On Tuesday of this week, just two days ago, EPA proposed a new rule saying, well, in the future, we won't necessarily, if you ask for an exception, we won't necessarily give you a complete exception. It's not an all or nothing decision, but we'll fine tune it. They don't really say how they're going to fine tune it. Um, but all of this is, all of this is rent seeking. It's a back and forth, it's a market for political influence. It's not doing anything for the environment. In fact, it's damaging the, the environment. I think EPA would do, uh, would do much better in the future if they were less ready uh, to do business with the bootleggers and just stuck to the mission and to promote <coughs> public interest. Um, is EPA a victim or a perpetrator? Often they're a victim. These forces are always present in Washington uh, and they're hard to resist. Uh, but EPA too often participates willingly, uh, and I think they should stop. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it looks like we don't have slides behind us. So I think like Anne, I was kind of depending on my slides. So when they're particularly critical, I'll kind of point them out. There was also some eye candy um, in my slides because it's after lunch. I thought you might need a little blood sugar visual. Um, and so I will sort of try to point that out as well. So some of my trivial, funny slides. Of course, the panel's expressions will tell you <laughs> whether they're good. Um, pardon? I'll go be Vanna White. There you go. Um, it is an amazing conference, and Jonathan, thank you so much for including me. Also, I'm back to my very first institutional home, seeing students from 24 years ago. Uh -huh. um, and also among my very favorite environmental uh, scholars. So it's, it's truly a, a pleasure to be here. So uh, since my age roughly corresponds with EPA, give or take a few years, I might be cheating a little bit, I'm very empathetic. Uh, with what it feels like to have a 50th birthday party. And so when I was invited to this particular conference, I was absolutely determined to be somebody that brings good cheer and happy news uh, to celebrate the 50 years of EPA's life. 
So I looked uh, for things to celebrate, and I found them. Um, and so to that end, I am going to talk about EPA's um, stunning role in pioneering some innovations in bringing rigorous expertise to the federal government. A little counterintuitive, but I'm going to part ways um, a little bit with at least one of my panelists. Okay, so first of all, um, if we look at EPA's Enabling Act that uh, you'd have to turn your head to see and you won't be able to read because of the screen size, in 1970 we had Enabling Act for the agency. And it was pretty clear at that time in 1970 uh, that we had four roles set out for EPA. One of them was clearly to be the nation's expert on pollution, toxic substances, anything having to do with the environment, and honestly all, th all four roles had to do with expertise. I don't think there's any question about that. But if we stop and think about what it means to be the nation's expert, we also need some autonomy or independence from the political process and also from the stakeholders. And in fact, there's a recent report by the OECD that says if we really want competent technical regulators, the most important thing is independence from the political process. Okay, so we know we need independence, but those of us in administrative law in particular know that in our current administrative state, current meaning over the last, since the 1940s, we haven't institutionally or legally designed an administrative state to provide room for that expertise. And instead, honestly, our obsession with political accountability of the executive branch is running headlong into our equally strong insistence on having agencies serve as experts. So to put it in simple terms, we have basically set EPA up and other expert agencies to fail. Um, we have designed institutional and legal processes that in part pose formidable obstacles to these agencies to provide the kind of expertise that we demand when we say they absolutely need to bring best science to the table. So what is there to celebrate? What I want to celebrate is EPA's ability to persevere nonetheless and acting within internally to actually create structures, maybe guardrails, um, to provide much more rigorous expertise than Congress or the White House would ever imagine, particularly to surmount some of these obstacles. So in my talk, I first want to talk about a little bit more about these formidable obstacles to actually being an agency expert. The title of my talk is it's not easy to be a bureaucratic expert. Um, and I want to talk about a few of those obstacles. Then I want to talk about some of the innovations. And most of these I'm pulling from a study I did for ACUS about five or six years ago. Um, Don Elliott was there. He was sort of a white knight at the end, but we won't go into that particular story. Um, but I want to talk about what I saw in ACUS and I've built on since then and some quick implications. So starting first with um, some of the formidable uh, formidable obstacles. I think first and foremost, in our system in the United States, the agencies sit within the executive branch, okay? So their boss is political appointees and their boss is the White House. That's how we designed it, that's how we make them politically accountable, right? Um, but that doesn't, that means, therefore, um, that if the White House, I'm sorry, contra to what uh, Administrator Wheeler said, if the White House or an appointee or anyone in that agency wants to give tap-down directions on what they want that result of that rule to be, they can do that. And so in a, in a study we did for Duke Symposium last spring, we documented uh, several dozen ways uh, that we have seen the executive branch manipulate in, in a very ends-oriented <coughs> ways the science in the agency's analysis. Sometimes the White House or other executive officials will actually change the numbers. Sometimes they will bully the scientists to change the numbers. Sometimes they will get rid of the scientists um, completely. And um, sometimes they will completely misrepresent what that scientific consensus in is a variety of ways. Those are only four ways up on my slide. We actually had more than a dozen different ways we have documented um, that the executive branch manipulates the very parts of the science. So, we know, um, and there's a good eye candy one, it's too bad it's not big because I really like that slide. Um, we know the presidents um, have some uh, uh, goals politically, and when the science doesn't comport with those goals, they are going to step out and manipulate the science, and we've seen that with Phil Cooney. Um, 
The White House also, we've heard, has the Office of Management and Budget who, by executive order, reviews rules, and they do, and they get way into the details. You can't see that, but that is a line edit of the scientific analysis in an agency's proposed rule by an OI, remember, who was not a scientist. Um, and they essentially have control over what comes out of the agency. Um, finally, of course, we have our political appointees, right? Um, and they are thick through the agency. That's a flowchart of the political appointees and the agency. And they are definitely going to make darn well sure that the stuff coming out of the agency is not going to be inconsistent with the political priorities of the president. They have full unilateral authority, essentially more or less, to do this. And virtually all of it is non-transparent. It's deliberative process. Okay? So the opportunities both to want to manipulate the science and to manipulate the science within the executive branch are uh, quite thick. Okay, let's add on to that the administrative process. We all say, you know, uh, oh, but stakeholders can catch this and sue. And that's absolutely true. So we have an administrative process, and what it does is it enlists stakeholders um, to essentially hold the agency accountable under the arbitrary and capricious standard, ooh, you're, you're being arbitrary with your science. And actually, that works great when we have all stakeholders engaged and all hands are on the deck and everybody's looking at what the agency's doing. Oh, the APA is great and the role of the courts is great. But we know empirically that that's rarely the case, that we have all hands on deck. In fact, half in the empirical studies done, half of EPA's rules have zero public interest comments. Um, almost exclusively industry comments on half the rules and on the rest of the rules, the, you can barely see it up there, but the white bar is industry. Um, the bar next to it that you can't see hardly at all is public interest. Um, industry completely overwhelms participation before the proposed rule is done and then during notice and comment. Okay, what that means in terms of who can sue is that we're going to have input that's coming into the agency coming primarily from one side. And when it comes time to sue, and you can't see my NRDC disappearing, you actually have credible threats of litigation only from industry. So the agency can be completely arbitrary in its science with respect to the public interest because there is absolutely no credible threat of ever being sued. Not that the agency responds to these in an irrational way. Nevertheless, this could be a biasing effect on the quality of the science. So we have the executive branch coming in. We have lopsided pressure coming in also legally. And finally, of course, we have an organization here that we're trying to manage. And we're trying to bring out the best expertise in a big organization like that. That's difficult. But it's even more difficult in our executive branch because the agency doesn't have control um, over its budget. Uh, the lines of authority, these are all politically potentially controlled. Wages competing with the market a whole variety of things. So the agency can find itself shrunk into nothing, but it doesn't have the uh, um, ability often to overcome the politics. So it's in this incredibly hostile institutional environment. We have an agency with the odds stacked against it in terms of being the kind of expert that it was created to be and that we really need it to be in terms of our nation. So what has EPA done? Bless its heart. So I don't have numbers, I don't have quantifications here of the successes that a EPA has. When it comes to scientific expertise, it's the process, essentially. Science is a process, so we measure good science, good expertise by rigorous, scientific-looking processes. So that's what I'm going to show you. Unfortunately, I'm not going to show you numbers. Um, but we will see that EPA has, in fact, and continues to uh, rise above all of this to provide amazing procedures for trying to provide scientific expertise, at least in light of the impediments. And to step back, um, perhaps the reason it's doing this, perhaps the reason it's so persistent in trying to be an agency expert, is because ultimately its success in the political environment and in the courts and in Congress is judged based on its expertise. So it has high level, strong incentives to be absolutely excellent. We've just created structures and legal systems that impede it from doing that, that create hurdles. Um, so uh, what has it done? Uh, here's a slide that you'll see three times. And this actually outlines some of the things that I found in the ACA study, none of which I was looking for, all of which amazed me. 
First of all, in some programs, and here's my big disclaimer, it was supposed to come up front. By no means am I saying EPA is always perfect as a scientific expert. There are many, many things going wrong. Many of the innovations I'm talking about are only in individual programs. Some of them are sometimes compromised. Staff can fail. I am not making unilateral statements. I'm simply saying um, that EPA has pioneered some innovations that deserve uh, celebration. Okay. So the first thing it has done is it said to uh, everyone, ooh, I got this biasing effect from stakeholders, I got this top-down thing. What I'm going to actually do is create a safe space for the scientific analysis itself, particularly the literature search that summarizes what the science actually says. Um, I am going to create subsets where I'm crea creating reports on what the science says, on what the literature searches are doing, and I'm also going to firewall my geeky scientific experts from the political process in doing that. They basically create an insulated expert space for their experts to tell us what the science says. Now, all of you are sitting there saying, well, of course, all agencies do that. No, I don't know of any agency that does that. The Fish and Wildlife Service decides whether to list an endangered species by pulling the political officials and having them sit side by side with a field biologist. It's one big political science decision. In this case, we're transparently first pulling out the science, what does it say, and then talking about what we want to do with that as a nation in terms of the policy. The second thing they do is they're insistent as an agency, again, this is not fail safe, but repeatedly from the beginning, EPA was determined to bring in skepticism. Skepticism is the heart of science. That's a procedure in science that's essential. They have peer review processes internally where the staff peer, reach, peer review each other. Um, they have also peer review processes where they bring in outside external experts, sometimes voluntarily. EPA created its own idea of expert advisory boards that was later codified into Congress that we see now instituted um, in a what, m much more wide-ranging way. They had many reasons for instituting these expert advisory boards, but the idea also was they wanted to produce skepticism internally on the quality of the work and externally on what the outside academic scientists who were reputable actually thought of the quality of the work. The final thing they did and are doing is to encourage the best in the scientific staff. They create attribution and authorship. This is a critical ingredient of science and science journals. The idea is if you're a technical staff doing one of these big reports that summarize the scientific literature, your name is on it. Um, all of a sudden, you are getting attribution. This is not some big anonymous bureaucracy. This is a place where you get credit and shame for the quality of the work you produce as a technical analysis doing this technical work. We also give attribution, or they give attribution, to the peer reviewers um, by name with their comments. Together, we stack these together, and we actually see what EPA is doing, is putting in scientific processes into how it uses science when it can. These are incredible innovations because they're not coming from the White House. They're not coming from Congress. What's most incredible is all but one, and maybe all of them, actually generate, were generated by EPA career staff. This was not coming from political officials. This was coming from within the technical expert staff about how science should be used. In fact, some of the best innovations I've outlined came in during the Bush II administration and also during the Reagan administration. The other thing these things do is they hardwire in um, an entire process I had ever more Trump slides, but I deleted them. They, and I'm, I'm nearly done. They hire, they're, high, they're hardwiring, hardwiring in, essentially a standard operating procedure for how you use science. And believe it or not, those prove much more resilient to the changing political winds because this is so permeating and infiltrating on how the agency does its work. Um, these are more resistant to immediate sort of changes in administration. You have to really do a lot of dismantling to get at the idea of attribution or authorship or skepticism. And so while there's a lot of monkeying around with external advisory boards, for example, I'm not aware, except for some violations of firewalls, of a lot of upending of some of these processes, which seem somewhat resilient over time. So what are the implications? Ultimately, really quickly, three, three takeaways. First of all, in my view, the fact that we see an agency 
create these kind of processes to bring the best science to bear on policy decisions, not because of the way we've set them up institutionally or legally, but in spite of it, is extraordinary. It is a testament to the idea of public administration and civic bureaucracy that we hear about. It is really something truly to celebrate. The second thing, it suggests that if we had a conference when EPA turns 60 and it's getting a little gray around the ears, if it doesn't dye its hair, um, all of a sudden we will actually probably see, despite what it's being, being dragged through, an agency that is even better and doing even more innovations and doing more special things if we give it the space essentially to do the innovations. The final thing is, if we really are committed to try to get rigorous expertise inside the government coming from the agencies, I think we need to look no further at some of the things the agencies themselves are doing, like EPA. Um, that's where we're finding the innovations and the good work. We don't have to create this from the ground up, from White House, certainly not from the White House, no matter who they are. Um, if we leave the agencies alone and we motivate them to be excellent, I think we'll see a lot of fabulous kinds of things come out of them. Okay. Thank you. So, reactions from the panel? Yeah. I was happy to hear that, that sometimes EPA brings in experts voluntarily, but I wonder what the experts say who were brought in involuntarily. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? In handcuffs or what? <laughs> I was just misfriends, I guess. But the, I mean, I agree with you absolutely that the, uh, the career staff at EPA go to great lengths to uh, cloak themselves in what they call science. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. It needs to be evaluated. Um, they go to great lengths to make sure that uh, no political appointee can interfere. Um, they go to great lengths to make their, de their decisions uh, almost unreviewable by courts for substance. They're very good at following the process, but uh, uh, no court is going to wait through you know, 50,000 pages of, of equations uh, that, that mm -hmm. the staff has built up over the years. The, the experts they bring in, you say, are the best, but how do you know that? They're handpicked by the agency, they're paid by the agency, and they're told what to say. Um, some committees are better than others, but I'm reluctant to concede that just by removing politics and saying we're going to give absolute power to people who can never be voted out, that scares me. There's a lot of po politicians I would like to vote out, but it scares me more to say, well, we just shouldn't let politics have anything to do with it and let ourselves be regulated by people who say, well, I'm a scientist, you have to do what I say, you have no choice and you have no appeal. That, that's just not the system of government we work under. So I think you might have misunderstood what I said. Um, I was talking about the agency career staff providing rigorous scientific analysis of the scientific literature um, and individual studies that try to synthesize the scientific literature. Now maybe there's a role for politics in uh, specifying the questions to be asked of what the literature says, and EPA actually solicits that political involvement. But I did not suggest that the agency scientists should determine what kind of policies we have or what rules we should have. I merely think that if we are summarizing what the science brings to a policy question, that it would probably be best to have the scientists provide that. Absolutely. Good. So we got agreement. We have nothing more to talk about. <laughs> I actually have well, a question. Someone say the answer is three. Administrator, you can only pick three. Mm -hmm. the science says pick three. Mm -hmm. The law says it's up to you. The science says you have well, to pick three. Just so just I'm not sure really I've ever seen yet. that, well, but, but anyway. But, but, but maybe just to intervene, there's a touch is on, the, um, and this just relates to the conversation that is very broad, and, and others have, have, have uh, you know, this is, you know, intervening a long conversation is about the question between kind of scientific inputs into regulatory decision-making processes and standards that are kind of scientized. Right, where we have, you know, the NACs are a good example, right? Protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. Mm -hmm. Now, that's clearly a question that implicates empirical reality, right? right. Things that we think of as being scientific um, or that science can tell us something about. But it's also something that implicates values and other decisions like that. So it seems to, uh, to some extent that the, some of the disagreement 
arises from questions about how we allocate certain kinds of decisions to scientists um, versus a broader process where, um, where we acknowledge that kind of political appointees have a legitimate voice and values are implicated and so on. Right. And I guess what I'm saying is that I actually think there's a role for summarizing what the scientific literature says before we start to talk about what to do with it. And right now, except for some aspects of EPA, we don't make that separation at all in agencies. It's all smooshed together. So we have no idea what's ends oriented and what's actually honest scientific work. And I think what EPA's effort to separate the two at a preliminary level and say this is what the literature says um, is a step in the right direction. This is peer reviewed, it's public reviewed, and the administrator can say I think your science stinks, you career staff. All of this is on the record and it's all open. I had a question for both of you guys. Um, so we talk about EPA and obviously I'm talking about I'm, well, I'm trying to separate out the political from the career. Um, and I wondered in your bootlegging whether you can trace some to political and some to career, how much of that is going on. And I guess, you know, this, the same from Michael, uh, you know, to the extent we see deviations, are, are we seeing, is it really a split between two conceptions of EPA? My answer is that, that both goes on. Um, the career staff engage in politics, probably small p politics would be a better description, uh, as much as the, the political appointees do. And for example, when uh, there was a bill that, uh, this was in, in Bush 43, and the White House had a, um, an energy bill which amended the Clean Air Act in some respects, and, and they had plans for, and, and they had agreements on the Hill for what was going to be done, even though they didn't control both houses at that point. Uh, the Republican Party did not. Um, but what the White House didn't realize is that the EPA career staff had much more intelligence on, on the Hill and much more control and, uh, and could, could make sure. I mean, many EPA staff are detailed to the Hill and are writing the, the laws uh, that are being, being debated. And, and so it, it was fairly easy to predict that you know, this, this is how it's going to come out because this is what the career staff wants. It doesn't matter what you say in the White House. That's how it's going to come out. And so I lived through that experience, and, and it's uh, instructive. Um, yeah, so, so I think that there really is like a, a very big difference in the career um, political appointee interface in this administration than in prior administrations. I don't think, and th I'm probably not saying anything overly controversial when I say that, right? That's... Uh, lots of folks agree about that. But the way I think about it in the context of EPA and the economist there, who is the group I'm most familiar with, is that to be a successful career economist at EPA, you have to, you know, know how to work with administrations of both political parties. Because, you know, that's just been the deal. You've faced the times when the Clinton administration is around and you've faced various Bush administrations. And so, um, and so a smart uh, staffer who is going to be successful is going to have priorities uh, to push in both types of administration. So I'm thinking about economists, so what are economists going to worry about? Mm -hmm. So in um, Republican administrations, they're going to think about how can we use markets, how can we use financial incentives, how can we reduce burdens when they're not achieving any benefits. Mm -hmm. During Democratic administrations, you say, okay, well, where are the big you know, net benefits that we can go? Where are there, uh, you know, where are the, where the, where's the stringency? Because that's what the Democrats are going to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And that um, that worked pretty well, you know. So during the Bush, George W. Bush administration, we had CARE, um, you know, really big, important market that actually got up and running. was was struck down, but still continued to be up and running for a while. And then, um, and then that, of course, use, was as the basis of the Casper rule. There was CAMER, which was the first attempt to use 111D to regulate, uh, to create a cap and trade system. Uh, ultimately, that uh, that you know that thinking at EPA translates into the Clean Power Plan. Uh, for obviously different uh, pollutants. But in any case, there's things that you're doing in both administrations, and, and that seems to have broken down in this administration, that there's a, a, a substantial amount, I mean, you just hear stories, they're horrible, about the hostility that, that folks face. And these are the economists. These are the folks who know how to work with Republican administrations. And so, um, so that's my broader concern, is if you start to break down you know, that system that has worked fairly well, it's not one that's perfect, but it's one where politics and expertise can interface with each other, I think, in largely productive ways, um, you know, that, that's going to become a problem going forward. So, questions. We have one 
I guess it's a kind of more of a question maybe for Michael. I'm just hearing Wendy's story, or basically she's kind of suggesting that scientific analysis or the scientists have kind of uh, been able to preserve or uphold a lot of the processes and procedures that they'd created over time to insulate themselves, where it seems that economic analysis, the framework of, for cost-benefit analysis, has proved a lot more vulnerable to manipulation <laughs> or to change in the current administration. So I'm wondering why you think that is. M maybe Wendy could weigh in on this too. Do you think that it's something inherent in the analysis or is it is it because in the economic analysis didn't didn't benefit from the same kind of institutional structures that Wendy's describing were developed to protect the hard science. And so if you think that going forward, we want to go and sort of rebuild the economic analysis function as part of rebuilding that function, and say in a new administration, going to also involve creating some new institutions comparable to the ones she's describing that protect the, the hard scientists. I think we'll, so there's a couple parts of this. So, so one is the, the agency has moved on some issues like the uh, thresholds for, you know, PM, right? So there's, it's not, I wouldn't say that, there, uh, that the administration is exclusively focused. Now that's an important input into cost benefit analysis, of course, but that's more on the science side. Um, but then you have other matters like the co-benefits uh, uh, or uh, the social cost of carbon is a, is a big one, right? And part of that is substantive in a sense. So um, on the social cost of carbon, the agency uh, quit using what was the best estimate of the social cost of carbon. This is the economic monetary. Uh, it's an estimate of the damages associated with greenhouse gas emissions. And there was just a couple of things that the, that the administration could do. They could change the discount rate, uh, used to calculate the social cost of carbon, and they could focus only on domestic effects rather than global effects. And those are just two really big ticket items that then are going to you know, really knock out a lot of the benefits. Uh, Co-benefits, again, it's just you can, you can do one thing and it will have a really big effect. Um, you know, as, a, as opposed to, um, yeah, so, so that might be part of the reason. Um, I don't know that the economic, and one other thing I'll just mention briefly, is, this is more speculative, it's a bit speculative, but those are arguably values decisions. I don't believe they're, they're decisions I think are wrong and that you can argue about why they're wrong and think quite persuasively. But, um, but if the agency says, look, this is the discount rate that we want to use, and they're not, I mean, in a sense, they'd be better off making a claim to just f be following the science. Um, but but in, in a way, it's, it's hard to push. It's, it's, it is outside the norm of the economics community, but um, I think it's colorably a values decision that you know, the agency might ultimately think it's going to have a better ch chance within court, as opposed to, say, uh, claiming there's no such thing as science, uh, clim uh, climate change. Right. That would be a thing that would be very difficult for the agency to get away with in court. Right. I'm gonna, I agree with most of what Mike says about the economics uh, at EPA. Um, and I think it actually it is in, in better shape than the science in terms of sticking to the standards of the profession. Um, but uh, they've had an uneven ride. It's hard to survive as an economist at EPA. And, uh, and that shop, which I supervised when I was there, um, has, has had some rough times. In the Clinton administration, uh, when Carol Branner had her first meeting to meet her senior staff, the head of that shop, the chief economist at uh, EPA, um, said, uh, uh, you know, I'm the chief economist, and she threw him out of the office and said, I never want to see an economist in here again. And so for eight years, she never did. They were part of the administrative <coughs> office, but just kept their heads down and did research, published papers, they had no influence on policy. And when I got there, I actually had to negotiate to get them to come back to work. They were, and uh, you tell them, your job is not just academic, you have to work on policies that the, the agency is considering. Um, so they've had a rough ride. Um, and I think it's not so cut and dried on things like uh, in, international benefits, right? The social cost of carbon. Uh, the Obama administration was using a global global number, but think about it. Now, this is—it's true. Ricky Rivez likes to say no self-respecting economist would uh, would say that the right answer is just to use domestic benefits. That's true, but no self-respecting lawyer would say that EPA is authorized to act on behalf of the rest of the world against the United States. Right? If, if a rule doesn't pass a benefit cost test when you're using uh, domestic benefits, that means you're imposing net costs on the United States. And why are you doing it? Well, to help other countries. Uh, 
That's something that Congress can do. We give foreign aid all the time, but I don't think Congress has authorized EPA to use all of its regulatory powers, all of, all of its statutes, to use them against the United States in order to help other countries. I think that's a decision for Congress to make. Um, and I, I'm just reluctant to, to say, well, politics isn't working, Congress isn't working, let's just let the experts rule the world. Uh, it doesn't appeal to me. So just real quick, um, within the science and sort of responding to your, your question, all of this is a, a continuing game, obviously, and we don't know what the next play will be. So with regard to the agency's expertise, and I won't you know, explicitly disagree with you, but I do. Um, <laughs> um, with regard to the expertise point, I think um, the Trump administration is, is not admiring of each EPA's autonomy or its expertise, and it's pr pretty explicit and frank about that, and that's part of the reason he's president. <coughs> so he's doing a, a, a good job attacking a lot of the structures I put up there as best he can, and there is a transparency rule that Scott Pruitt um, proposed and is on the table uh, for Administrator Wheeler. So there is possibilities of top-down dismantling of some of the things I put up there um, that are certainly out on the table and feasible that you c could actually sort of do a, a nuclear bomb approach to what the agency is doing. I do believe there's resilience, though, when you have a career staff that have done things so long for so many ways that once you lose some of those atomic bombs and get rid of them, things might return back to normal. All right. We have... Uh, uh, my question is and and that is uh, you talked about some wonderful examples of contradictions of <coughs> ethanol and so on um, the one that's come to mind it seems uh, I just turned it off. Right, thanks anyway um, the recent contradiction to me it seems is you got the electrical vehicle subsidies a friend of mine said she got a seventeen thousand dollar subsidy for buying a, a Tesla in the same time we're shutting down appliances that they don't you know, my appliance breaks because the electricity standards you know to make it more efficient with electricity or electric light bulbs you know you're banning them to save electricity is there a contradiction uh, that I'm missing here in uh, policy between the electric vehicles electric light bulbs and uh, appliances my opinion on most of those, I mean, there is an argument that an, there's an externality whenever you use energy of any kind. Um, I'm not sure uh, how large that is, but certainly people uh, do value I mean, efficiency in your cars and appliances saves you money. So people value that. Um, I think DOE and uh, NHTSA and EPA uh, tend to disagree with people's valuation. Most of the benefits from appliance efficiency standards uh, are attributed not to any effect on the climate or any externality or any market failure. They are attributed to savings that consumers should want if they were just smart enough. <laughs> and uh, I hesitate to create a government that, that approaches benefit-cost analysis that way. I see benefit-cost analysis figuring out what people, what makes people, improves their welfare and, and figuring out a system to correct market fail failures so that they can achieve that, rather than say, people are too stupid to buy the, the light bulb that I think they should have or the cars I think they should drive, so I'm going to make them do it and say they're better off. Uh, agencies are increasingly doing that and say, well, everybody knows consumers are irrational. Well, I mean, so are bureaucrats. Um, so <laughs> we'll have to figure out how to live with each other. Um, so I just have a, just a follow-up to that. Um, just a question, this is a question, though which is whether your objection to those kinds of uh, behavioral economic justifications for regulations, is that a, do you think of that as a kind of a philosophical or principled objection? That, so you object across the board or, or so if, if I was to show you that kind of systematically uh, people for, you know, you know, reasons that we understand reasonably well, underinvest in energy efficiency such that a rule that increased the efficiency of products on the market would be welfare enhancing. Would you object to that on libertarian grounds, or would you accept that that would be grounds. the case? Because you would. I think, okay. I think that, uh, yes, all of us make mistakes, make imperfect decisions, be satisfying. And there, there's a vast literature on that. Um, I think giving some people guns and saying, okay, you guys are the government, you make the other guys do what's good for them, it doesn't help in that situation. If people are 
people are not angels, but that doesn't mean you just need more government to uh, tell them what to do. And I think it's it's a real, it, it's a little, it's a problem when people don't understand their own uh, welfare function very well, and none of us, none of us is really perfect in that. But it's a bigger problem when you say, well, your your own welfare function is not up to you anymore. The government's going to tell you what's good for you. That yeah, I do have a philosophical objection to that. All right. So. Um, So just a, a quick thought on the on the, the question of light bulbs, um, you know people were paying people were um, offloading to future generations the total cost of electric lighting when they used incandescent light bulbs, um, and one one fact many people don't realize and this is based on some research by Lucas Davis, an economist at Berkeley, but um, largely because Walmart said to its suppliers, if you give us a good looking LED bulb for under under ten bucks, we'll make it the house brand. Um, LED light bulbs have now been widely adopted in households. They save households millions of dollars, and they're responsible for, in part, for the first time since the Second World War, the U.S. household electricity sector per capita leveling off and now going down. Uh, so they're saving millions of dollars. The U.S. household sector, all these sources within the U.S. household sector, um, uh, if you think of all the emissions from that household sector, would be equal to all the emissions from all the sources in South America. So we're actually having a profound effect on the cost of electricity, the use of electricity, and global carbon emissions because Walmart and some others have pushed for the, uh, the availability of LED light bulbs. Uh, number two, Brian, I was Carol Browner's chief of staff. We, you and I should talk later. Uh, if you're a law student in this room, please at least put an asterisk next to the statement that she never met with an economist in eight years. We and I, you and I need to talk about that a little bit. Because we don't need to have a discussion about that. Uh, one other just quick thought. Uh, Lisa Bressman and I did a survey that included almost every Bush 41 and Clinton uh, uh, Senate-confirmed appointee. And one thing that emerged from that, uh, we, we talk a lot about uh, cost-benefit analysis, and we sort of assume that OMB is the interacting vehicle with EPA. And we, we treat that almost as a piece of the sort of notion of a unitary executive. The White House speaks through OMB. And what we found universally is that's not true, right? That there are many other departments within the White House that have a lot of effect on EPA. So when we're thinking about cost-benefit analysis, put it in the, in the light of the Legislative Affairs Office and the Domestic Policy Council. And here's the second thing we found, that not one person could remember one situation in which CBA was used by OMB to make a rule more stringent. We couldn't find one example in the period of 16 years of two presidential administrations. So that might be because the EPA is always making a rule greener than it should be from a cost-benefit analysis, or it might be that both EPA and the White House economists have very deeply different perspectives on what is the appropriate policy, and it's getting reflected through these debates. But we just have to account for that as we're having these conversations. So I have a question for you, Michael. Um, so uh, I too am concerned about the erosion of norms uh, from this administration, um, most of them outside of the environmental context. Um, I'm curious why you, uh, what is the basis for your worry that norms are going to erode in the contexts in which you are discussing them? So for example, the social cost of carbon, as you said, might reflect policy choices, right? That might be, those might be value judgments about, I mean, we can argue about that, but, but you could imagine pretty easily a new administration coming in and revising the social cost of carbon to include international uh, benefits and so forth. So help me, I, I, I just want, I'm, I'm um, trying to be optimistic that norms are not gonna erode, that this is an aberration, that we're not gonna see this going forward. Um, so you but you, but you seem pessimism. you seem more pessimistic, and I want to know back why. Off. I'm so very I'm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wendy's the optimist. Right. Let's hear from your pessimistic side. So um, so so th just run a scenario. Obviously, this is kind of predicting the future a little bit. So this could be wrong. So I think that there's two paths that we might imagine. Who knows what what the next administration is going to look like? It's going to be a Democrat. Who the Democrats would be? Um, but at some point, there will be a Democratic administration, and we could I feel like imagine two different paths. Um, that that administration could go down vis-a-vis -vis this question of specifically economics, economic analysis, and how independent that should be, you know, how 
how much should the economics be the you know be in purpose of political goals versus a constraint on or informing the policy choices and one option would be essentially revert back to the Obama administration approach you know uh, and the which was also the approach of the Bush administration largely against guardrails mm -hmm. with some policy differences um, which is fine and that would be that's the happy story and that may happen Another story would be to say something like, look, you can imagine someone, a political appoint, senior political appointee, uh, when faced with, a, with this question, the economists come back from both EPA and OMB and say this is not a good rule. On the other hand, you have political forces that are saying, look, uh, we, have a, you know, we have a political reason to do that. We have a, strong, a constituency that wants this. And the president or the chief of staff or some other senior person in the White House says, well, you know what? Freaking Trump did this all the time, yeah. you know. Yeah. Why the hell do we have to, you know, take on board these constraints right. if the other administration isn't doing that? And and then that's kind of one more, you know, hole in the dam. And so I think that's the worry is that. And then the next administration comes in. Well, you know, the Warren people used to do this all the time. And then so you know it becomes a mess. In the context of still having a social cost of carbon, which is a guardrail at some level, right? So right. But over time, you can imagine. I think the concern would be over time. You know, so yes, social cost of government, although it can differ between five and five hundred dollars, depend and then you know, say the VS the value of statistical life. Well no one's messing around with that, but who knows? You know, you can imagine over time. I think the concern is that these start to break down. Right. <clears throat> this question's for Wendy. Um so I, I buy your account entirely, uh, and I think it's great that there are these natural incentives for developing this expertise within the agency. My question is do you think there are adequate incentives uh, for agencies like EPA uh, to communicate science uh, to the public? Uh, in an ideal world, uh, communicating scientific knowledge to the public could actually dissolve the difference between politics and expertise. Um, and I don't know that EPA really has enough incentive to communicate uh, its information uh, to the public uh, in a digestible form. Um, or maybe it's actually some kind of constraint on the agency. Uh, I mean, I know we talked about the Anti-Deficiency Act uh, earlier, right, and the WOTUS rule, um, where you know EPA uh, really was kind of uh, hamstrung when it came to communicating with the public and counteracting some of the narratives that were out there about that rule. So just wondering what your thoughts are about communicating some of this expertise to the public. That's a fabulous question. And I hadn't even thought about that aspect of the scientific expertise. I, again, like to think of this as an evolutionary story, um, and this isn't a static thing. Over the last 50 years, the developments I, I showed on, on, the, on the slides um, have sort of continued cumulatively over time. And so I could imagine a world where um, EPA sees increasing rewards and success associated with translating the work that it's doing for the public. I think in the past it hasn't had those incentives and hasn't done a very good job at all. I think probably the reverse, actually. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that in this particular climate and going forward, it wouldn't have incentives. With that said, you know, a, a big major downer footnote, and I promised myself I wouldn't be downer because of the 50th thing. But it is the possibil there is a possibility that if the agency staff is com largely gutted and replaced with hires done by political officials, um, that we could see a very different kind of agency than the one I described with a very different mission. Um, so it's not in response to your question, it's essentially a caveat. But I, I, could, I, I would predict that if drastic bad things don't happen, um, that we would actually see that communication improving over time, although maybe not as, as quickly as it needs to. Other. Well, maybe I'll, I'll make a note uh, on the communication um, issue, uh, both pessimistic and, and encouraging. I mean, if you, if you can get into the bowels of the EPA website, you'll find some very effective, very good uh, explanations of technical issues. The problem is finding them. The problem is getting through the agency's website to find useful information. That is... Even when you know something exists, you can have a really difficult time um, finding it. So um, there's, there's some, I think, some work to be done. Well, and jumping on the Environmental Law Institute, but also academic um, institutions probably could serve a mediator, translator role that would be extremely valuable. If there is lots of great stuff buried there that's accessible, that's precisely the kind of stuff 
we might be able to help with as law schools. I mean, one thing I just, as we're trying to talk about kind of science in its public role, is I think that um, there's a way in which um, communicating the domains of science and kind of where empirical uh, questions can be resolved through scientific, the scientific method, or at least informed, versus being clear about where the values decisions necessarily arise in environmental policy making, I think that would have an enormously useful role for the public, which um, is very, very, scientists are, my scientist friends are very confused about that, that matter because they're not really trained um, in that question. Uh, the public is hugely, um, and I think that there are, there are mistakes that the advocacy community makes by saying things like, well, we should just do what the science says we should do. Well, science never says what you should do. It's that's like right. literally, that's like the naturalistic fallacy that Hume points out. It's just, it does not work that way. Science can tell you with your value system, I don't want the world to end, plus science might tell you what to do, but you still need the, the moral, you know, kind of part of that equation. So being clear about that, I think, would be a, a, a great service. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Beautifully put. Can, can a, great way to, uh, a great way to yes. end this panel, I think. Thank you. Well, on that point of agreement, um, we have uh, our last 15 minute break, and our final panel will uh, begin at 3 o'clock. It will be another great panel, so I uh, hope to see you all back here in 15 minutes. I am told there are still cookies from lunch. <laughs> So um, get your sugar fix, get your coffee. I totally disagree. See you in 15 minutes. <laughs>